Hi, everyone. So we're about to get started here. Um, I want to say a big thank you and welcome for everyone who's here today. Um, this afternoon, we're having a special event in honor of FRISD's upcoming Founders Day, which is on March 22nd. So before we jump in, just a little bit of housekeeping. You've all been muted for this presentation, and we encourage you to post questions in the Q&A feature, and we're going to do our best to answer them either while we're speaking or at the later portion of the program. So without further ado, I am going to share my screen and we'll get started. So today, the title of our talk is Indigenous Histories, Past, Present, and Future. And this is the Rhode Island School of Design Museum and the Rhode Island School of Design. So, First, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. The Rhode Island School of Design is built on what is now called College Hill, part of the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Nation. Indigenous people from many nations near and far live, study, and work in Providence today. The amplification of Native voices and histories is crucial to rectifying the many violent legacies of colonialism, and we gratefully acknowledge the ongoing critical contributions of indigenous people across our state, region, and nation. So to introduce myself to y'all, um Yat E Sha Shandin Brown Yunishia, Akot Ego, Dine at Anishle, Kia Ani Nishle, Bilagana Bushishin, Plizathana Dushiche, Do Bilagana Dushinele. So hi everyone, my name is Shandine Brown. I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation and I just introduced myself in our language. I'm from Arizona, but recently I have been here in Providence, Rhode Island. Well, I say recently, it's been um, a few months, but I'm here as the Henry Luce Curatorial Fellow for Native American Art at the RISD Museum, which is here in Providence, Rhode Island. So just to do some brief background history of the RISD Museum, the RISD Museum was co-founded with the Institution and School of RISD in 1877, the overall museum collection comprises of about 100,000 objects. So out of that number, the Native North American art collection is comprised of about 1,000 pieces. And that is not including um, tribal people or indigenous people from outside of the 50 states. That number is exclusively including the tribes that are in the United States of America. So we do have more indigenous art, but we have an estimation of about a thousand pieces for Native North American art, which is primarily my focus. And a foundational portion of this collection is from the High Foundation and was acquired from 1943 to 1944, so about 80 years ago. And the High Foundation is a part of George Gustav's High's collection, and he was a Native American art collector who, at the end of his life, had actually acquired. 800,000 Native North American pieces. And so we do have a foundational historical collection as a part of the High Foundation. And finally, we have a diverse array of, array of tribal nations represented in, represented in our collection. And unfortunately, we don't have a historical basis of New England tribes, but we'll talk about that further in the presentation and what that means. So here's um, an image of the RISD Museum in 1926. So to start off today, I wanted to show a historic piece. We're gonna go through about three historic pieces and you're all getting a insider look into the catalog card for this piece. The, cat the RISD catalog card is this first um, pan card. So we can see here it says Indian, North America, Southwest, um, it's in the costume department, and part of my position is working with the registration team here at the museum, and the registration team had actually reached out to the National Museum of American Indian, which is the Smithsonian Institution, to see if they had more information on our high foundation pieces. So Mr. High's collection that I was speaking about, that 800,000, eventually formed to be the National Museum of American Indian, and that is located in both Washington, D.C. and New York City. So 
Here we have the NMAI, or National Museum of American Indian Catalog Card. And they put a big gray arrow because from this catalog card, we can glean more information about the work. So here it says it's from O'Reilly, Arizona. It also says it was purchased from Fred Harvey. Note that Fred Harvey is a really famous collector. Um, he was the founder of the Harvey House, which was a tourist group in the Southwest. And so we have a little bit more information. Note here, we also do not have the maker's name or information. And this is a common thread throughout our historic Native American um, pieces. So here we have two images. So the image we just looked at, this is a piece in our collection. Um, this is an archival photo of a Hopi bride. So you can see with her, um, her regalia, she has multiple pieces of woven tapestry in this beautiful cream white color. So also we see that sash in our collection is very similar to the sash that is, she's holding her reeds in, a reed roll. And so it's called oftentimes a rain sash because that um, tapestry, the way it, it falls down almost looks like rain. And then on the right here, we have a photo of Oribe, which is the, um, located on the third Mesa on the Hopi Reservation in Arizona. So if you are interested in looking at any of our historic collections, note you can go to rizdmuseum.org slash art design slash collection, and you can look up pieces with our search tool. So this is um, just a screenshot from our image, I mean, from our website, and you can see the exhibition history and actually um, the archival label that was in this exhibition in the 90s. So again, just kind of exploring more about our historic collection, where things came from and what they were used for. So moving on to this next piece, this is a chill cat robe. Again, you're getting a little bit of an insider look with our accession card here. Um, so the chill cat robe we have in our documents is um, late 19th century. We have, you know, the description of it, but again, put a gray arrow for this portion where it says source unknown, because this is not an uncommon practice in the museum field, but we actually do not know the provenance of this piece. And then on the right here is actually a picture of how the silk hat robe was used in a exhibition here at RISD. So if you can see, it's a little hard to see. It says Eskimo. So different native Alaskan things were in this exhibition. And it's just an interesting look at the past to see how the museum had practiced in the past. Um, and so moving on, here is a in color photo of the robe. This was most likely a child's robe because it is large, but imagine this is going to be wrapped around your body. So we think it was probably for a child. And then on the right here is a picture of students looking at the robe. So in the fall, we had an event with the RISD and Brown University Native American students looking at contemporary and historic works in our collection. And it was really great for this piece to be seen by our students. So this image on the left is not our chill cat robe in our collection, but I wanted to include it because you can see that this was made to be, this textile was made to be a garment and it would be worn by both men and women in traditional chill cat dances. And chill cat are a sect of the Clinket tribe, which is on the Northwest coast. So we have this map here. And I think this is just a great, again, we're looking a great example of how things got into our collection and also where they came from and what they were used for. So just to plug the website again, if you'd like, you can look up a lot of our pieces in the Native North American collection on the website. And again, we do have an exhibition history label where you can read what that was on the label when it was on exhibit. And this was in 2004. So now moving on to our third piece that we're going to talk about today, we have the RISD catalog card on the left. So this was, again, a part of the High Foundation. 
that became transferred to us. And you can see the date here is October 10th, 1944. And then the piece that um, the Cradle Board, the piece is on our website. So if you'd like to look more, you can. And so here is that NMAI catalog card that was also included with the Hopi rain sash. So no, our chill cat robe was not a part of that foundational high collection, but the cradle board is. So the cradle board and the rain sash among a lot of others. And so here we see again, more information that is really helpful for the curatorial process. We see that this was actually, this cradle board was a part of Colonel James F. Randlett's personal collection that then was transferred to the High Foundation and then transferred to us. So it says here, exchange with Museum of Art, Rhode Island School of Design, August 1944. So here on the right is a portrait of Lieutenant Colonel James F. Randlett. And Randlett was the local Indian agent and commanding officer at Fort Duchesne in Utah that is east from Salt Lake City, and he was there until 1896. So an Indian agent was someone who worked for the U.S. federal government or the Bureau of Indian Affairs and was in charge of making relationships with the local tribes in the West, and oftentimes their role was to guide Native people into assimilation through either missionaries, um, boarding school, or enforcing other legal statutes. So it's a really interesting history to dissect and think about how um, Randlett got this into his personal collection, especially because he was at Fort Duchesne and this is a Kiowa piece and the Kiowa people are located in Oklahoma. So I just included this piece because it's a really beautiful item, but also because this piece was included in Manual 16. Manual is the RISD Museum's publication that is always um, creating really wonderful, wonderful articles and um, publication pieces. So I invite you to read this piece in its entirety. This is from Manual 16. It's titled, Our Cradle Boards Are Living Beings, a conversation with Vanessa Poe Kijok Jennings and Carl Jennings. So Vanessa is a Kiowa cradle board maker. And so a part of what we're doing now here in the present, as we just talked about some of the past, is working with Native people and Native artisans to have more information on some of our historic collection. And this piece in particular was really led by our editor, Amy Pickworth, as well as one of our curators in costume and textiles, Kate Irvin. So on the left here, again, is another archival image of how the Native American pieces were stored in RISD Museum exhibitions. So you can see the cradle board is being up right on the left here. And so this is a picture of Vanessa and Carl. So in this entire publication, Vanessa is speaking about the um, many different nuances of cradle boards, especially in Kiowa culture. So I'm just gonna read a very brief excerpt here. Um, she says, Every cradle board, you go into it like you're dealing with the living connection to that unborn baby. Cradle boards were meant to be used, especially during that time. If the baby didn't live, it wasn't unusual for the cradle board to be the coffin for the baby. So it makes sense why there aren't so many older ones or in this style, because quite a few were buried with the babies. I mean, life isn't easy, which is another thing about cradle boards. That's the beginning of them. That old woman praying and saying life is hard. It's incredibly hard but making a cradle board ties all these animals to this child. They're there to support him and help him. And then the father of the baby and the mother of the baby, their spirit is tied to it. So again, you can look at this entire publication in manual 16. And then I also included these images just so you could see how a cradle board was used because we also showed how the chill cat robe and the Hopi rain sash was used. So on the left here is a baby in a Kiowa cradle board. This is Vanessa's sister, Stavetta, and then Vanessa is on the right here. And then on our most right image, that's Vanessa with a cradle board that she made. So it's a really, um, to me, it's a really beautiful, you know, process to see um, your yourself or your sibling be a cradle board and then the one that you carry for your baby. So. 
again, talking about the present work we're doing here with the Native North American Art at RISD Museum. I wanted to include some recent acquisitions that we've been um, working on and really excited about. So the first one I'm going to talk about is um, Breach Logbook 21, Nebulous Account Study Number One. This was made in 2021 by Courtney Leonard, who is a Shinnecock artist born in 1980 and is actually a RISD alumna. Um, she received her Master's of Fine Arts and Ceramics in 2008. So this piece is an earthenware with glaze and wood palette. And I would like to note that this piece was really led by Elizabeth Williams, who is our curator of decorative arts. So this piece, we're planning for it to be on view this year. So make sure you come to the museum and check it out. And Courtney is a really amazing artist. Um, the Shinnecock people are indigenous to Long Island. And a lot of her work has to do with ocean, waterways, sustainability, climate change, and what does it mean to be a Shinnecock person? As Shinnecock literally translates to a person of the shore. So again, this will be a um, sneak peek, sneak preview, insider information. This will be on view this year, so make sure you come by the museum. So moving on to another, another acquisition that we're really excited about. These, both of these pieces, they're called Reincarnation and Shard. They were made by Rose B. Simpson. A Rose is from Capo Wingue and in English, that's Santa Clara Pueblo. And she was born in 1983. She is also another RISD alumna and received her Master of Fine Arts and Ceramics in 2011. So you can see that these are both ceramic pieces um, made with glaze, grout, lava beads, coral beads, um, for reincarnation with sea urchin, turquoise beads, glass beads, and epoxy. And then for shard, this again was made with ceramic, glaze, grout, linoleum, steel, copper, wire, and epoxy. So I would like to also note that this acquisition was led by Dominic Malone, who's our curator of contemporary art. And again, this is, um, this should be on view this year. So make sure you check out um, our galleries to see the installation. I also just wanted to note that Rose last year was included in the Pulling on the Thread podcast, which is a RISD podcast. Um, the podcast episode is about 30 minutes long, and it's a really great way to learn more about Rose's practice from her onwards. Um, and in this episode, she specifically, specifically talks about Maria, which is an El Camino that she refurbished in 2014. So Rose is really talented as she's not only a ceramic artist, but also does automotive work. So for the final acquisition that we're gonna talk about that is um, in our Native North American collection is both of these pieces by Elizabeth James Perry. Elizabeth is a Quinoa Wampanoag and was born in 1973. So this first piece here on the top, the wampum belt, it's titled Starscape Wampum Belt. And then below that is Thunderbird over Red Earth. So this wampum belt was made with quahog shell disc beads on hand spun, naturally dyed milkweed plant cordage wraps. So for context, each bead is made from an individual quahog shell. And often if you're walking around local Rhode Island beaches or if you're at the Rizzi beach, you can actually find a quahog shell. And that um, is a beautiful purple on the belt. And then for Thunderbird over Red Earth, that's made with patterned twined woven soft white, soft fiber, naturally dyed and more dented matter root, logwood and Osage orange. So I also just wanna note that this acquisition was led by our costume and textiles team, um, Kate Irvin and Lauren Brewer. So with all of that said, um, there's a lot of things happening at the museum. Like I said, we have plans for all three of the pieces that we just discussed to be on exhibition, but also this fall, you can look forward to seeing Being and Believing in Nature. Um, this exhibition is about different perspectives from ancient Mediterranean, Asian, and Native North American, selected from the RISD Museum permanent collections. And this is an exhibition that is being curated by Gina Borromeo, who is our curator of ancient art, Yi Chong, who's our Associate Curator of Asian Art, and myself, um, the Henry Luce Curatorial Fellow for Native American Art, and that will be opening this fall. 
So now I would like to introduce some of our RISD students who are joining us today. Um, I am really excited to have our first student, Quincy, talk to us about their or in their work. Um, Quincy, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience today? Yes. <clears throat> Just a moment. Uh, okay. Um, Taylor Quincy Wapanoshi. Um, hello, Quincy is the name that I am called. Um, my ancestors come from the Lower Rogue River um, in Oregon. Um, and my bands are Sixtes, Mikunutne, Yashue, Chastakosa, and Tutsutni. Um, I grew up in Beaverton, Oregon, right outside of Portland, Oregon, um, and I'm a student here at RISD um, in my fourth year of architecture. Um, and uh, I tried to focus on uh, intertwining both my Black side and my Native side, as in many cases, uh, those two cultures clash a lot. So that's what I focus on in my work, whether it be uh, vaguely architecture, but mostly other mediums. Um, this piece right here um, is called Danihui. Uh, which is a uh, meaning uh, for water in my, my language. Um, I chose this as the title um, to show the water bottles uh, as kind of like a metaphor for how alcohol is drinking like water. Um, I made this piece uh, at a time when alcohol was a very bad problem with my grandma. Um, and I got an urgent phone call regarding her um, and alcohol. And so, um, I felt very out of touch being all the way across the country. And so this piece was kind of a result of these emotions that were kind of building up. Um, and the bottles are all branded with the word um, in on water bottles. Uh, and uh, when painting this, I used gouache and acrylic, but I actually watered down the gouache um, and mixed it with rum uh, and painted with that uh, in the parts that are like, I would say like a brownish orange um, to make it smell like uh, alcohol when uh, you get close enough to it. Um, you want to go to the next slide? Yes, um, really quickly, Quincy, can you tell our audience um, your RISD major? Architecture. But you're also a painter and a weaver. So Quincy is a multi-talented artist. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about this piece? Yes, yes. Um, so this piece, actually, um, I named it Weaving Timelines, or uh, I'd say Dene, uh, which doesn't mean Weaving Timelines, Dene just means, uh, it's actually a very unique word. I, it's hard to explain the meaning, but it's kind of a place that one calls home, but it's like a place like no other. So it's a place where ancestors are buried, um, where your people are from, where uh, uh, all the cultural things happen and it's like a place that can only be that place and no other place. Uh, that's kind of what Dene means. Um, so this piece, these pieces were actually a series of weavings I did for my design studio at RISD. Um, and the weavings are in order and represent a timeline of my people's history going all the way from first contact um, to negotiating and coexisting with settlers and then um, a depiction of the trail of tears that my people had to walk to get to the coastal reservation the government assigned to my ancestors, um, which was not the permanent reservation as the wood and the land had too much value in the eyes of the settlers um, and soon relocated my people to what is now the Sleds Reservation. Um, in these weavings, uh, many treaties were signed and much land was stolen through a series of seven treaties. Um, which are shown in blue, uh, like blue kind of document. They look like documents, there's seven of them in one of the weavings. Um, and they gave around 2.5 million acres of land to the government over these seven treaties. And that was just those treaties. There's a ton of other treaties that were signed and many that were actually lost on the way to uh, DC. Um, and lots of violence was involved in the relocating of my ancestors as many greedy and angry white settlers that were uncontrolled by the government, uh, often killed innocents. Um, in this, it's important to note that my tribe was terminated in 1954. Um, the, and the following that I'm gonna say is actually quoted from my mother's thesis that she wrote on the termination of my tribe. 
Um, so uh, it's quoted, without effective opposition to public law 588, the Slits Grand Ronde, Coquille, Coos, Lor, Umqua, Sisla, and other Oregon tribes, my being Slits, uh, succumbed to termination August 13th, 1954, when President Eisenhower signed the bill into law. Trust protection and services provided by the Bureau of Indian Affairs came to an end. For the sleds in the Central Coast Range, Interior Secretary Fred Seaton approved the tribal rule two years later, enabling each tribe member to receive a final payment of $792 for the sale of the reservation timber and grazing lands. Congress also passed a Senate Bill 2754, which came into public law on August 13, 1954, calling for the termination of federal supervision over the property of the Klamath Tribe of Indians located in the state of Oregon and the individual members. The law which affected the Klamath and Modoc tribes and the Yahushkin Band of Snake Indians defined tribal property as real or personal property plus water rights that had been held in trust for the tribes and individuals. Uh, a tribal role would be created and at midnight of the day of the enactment of this act, the role of the tribe shall be closed and no child born thereafter shall be eligible for enrollment. Um, and then it was not until many years later in 1977 after a long fight um, with the government uh, from my elders and ancestors that uh, my tribe uh, was put back into in motion and restored in uh, 1977. And then 1980, uh, the president actually signed this into law and gave my people 3,063 acres uh, of land, which is the land we have today. So that's what's depicted in these series of seven. I don't know how many weaving one. There's, I think there's, go ahead and go to the next one. Yeah, there's, yeah, seven weavings. Thank you so much for sharing. So for our viewers, if you look at this image, um, you can see this story of seven. And Quincy, I'm curious, um, out of all the different art practices that you work on, which one is your favorite, if you have a favorite? Um, I would say, I mean, I, I would stick to, to weaving, specifically this type of weave, which is like a Sally bag weave. That's the nickname. I was actually uh, taught this weave by Pat Courtney Gold. Uh, she's a master basket weaver, but it's just a very, um, it takes a lot of patience, but it pays off. Uh, and it's not, I would say this, this style of weave is closely associated with my native style, like my tribe specific style of weave because regional, uh, there's a lot of similarities between regions. Um, but I would say that my favorite would be my traditional style of weave, which uh, I definitely need to dive in more. Um, but uh, just the process of gathering and drying and soaking and getting your hands all like blistered up and it just takes your mind off of everything I feel. So uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing with us. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add about your artistic practice? Um, I think that's about, this is about it. Um, yeah. I mean, on my Instagram, I have a lot more illustration um, depicting, uh, I'm into Afrofuturism, but like a mix of indigenous and African futurism, because I'm both. Um, so I try to depict that in illustration a lot. And if you look at my Instagram, you'll see a couple of kind of illustrations that deal with identity in a very comical way, um, so. Thank you, Quincy. And like Quincy said, make sure to check out um, his Instagram. And we did put that in the chat. Thanks so much. Thank you. So now we are going to transition to Lady, Lady Nudson, who is Cree and Turtle Mountain Chippewa. Um, hi, Lainey. Could you introduce yourself to our audience today? Yeah. Um... I'm Lainey, I use they, them, there's pronouns. Um, like Shandine said, I'm Anishinaabe and Cree. I'm enrolled in the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, um, which is in North Dakota, but I am from Montana. Um, 
I am a fourth year dual degree student at RISD. I am studying painting. And at Brown, I'm studying ethnic studies with a focus on Native American and indigenous studies. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about um, the self-portrait piece. What was inspiration behind it? And can you tell our audience a little bit more about beadwork as well? Yeah, so I grew up um, surrounded by a lot of beadwork, um, a family kind of thing. Um, but it wasn't really something I started doing until I came to college. And I think it was because I was missing my family. I was missing my community. Um, and so beadworking was kind of a very therapeutic form of connecting with those people who I missed but am so far away from. Um, so this is a self-portrait I made. Um, it was a long process of trying to take a selfie and then mapping it out and then uh, finding the right bead colors. And it's still like unfinished um, and I hope to come back to it one day but I haven't really had the opportunity to do so but I'm really interested in beadwork um, and would like to continue to use it in my work. And do you see a lot of parallels with beadwork and painting? Well I always consider myself an animator before painter. I originally at RISD I was a FAV major, film animation video major. Um, and I can cons consider myself an animator before a painter. And I think that when I'm beating, it reminds me of animating, doing this kind of repetitive motion over and over and over again. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, as a beadwork fan, I, I really do enjoy this piece. So moving on, um, would you like to tell us more about this work? Yeah, um, so a lot of the themes in my work kind of revolve around these kind of feelings of like longing or love, or I think a lot about like what it means to have inherited trauma or what it means to, um, with with inherited trauma, there's also inherited love or inherited resilience. Um, this was something I made last semester in my painting class when I was just thinking a lot about um, like those kind of memories, those kind of feelings. I work a lot with the uh, imagery of playground equipment. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I def that was the first thing, you know, when I looked at the work, I definitely noticed was this um, slide. And it, again, brought back a lot of memories for me as well. Um, and anything else about this piece you'd like to add? I don't think it's so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so now we're going to go to um, Milk. And Lainey, before we play the video, would you like to tell our audience a little bit more about the work? Yeah, so this was a piece that I made last year in my animation course. Um, and uh, the script of this piece um, I wrote in like a couple of minutes, like 12 minutes is how long it took me to write this. And I was thinking a lot about um, what it means to be neglected. And I was also thinking a lot about how, you know, missing and murdered indigenous women is such a large thing and uh I, I guess the what I was kind of going for was the perspective of a young girl who's has a family member who goes missing and being unable to understand what is happening um this entire film is done on celluloid animation so it's all transparency sheets that are painted each individual frame um the narration is done by my friend Rayleigh Fourkiller a really lovely um, Cherokee writer and good friend of mine. So, okay, so we're gonna play it now. Mom doesn't drink milk anymore. I think I read somewhere that it's actually pretty gross that humans consume so much milk from an animal that's a different species than us. I tried to ask my teacher how we get cow's milk. I guess the answer seems obvious. I know humans only make milk when they are going to have a baby but I've never really thought about if it was the same for animals too. 
Kind of like how people believe that baby carrots are actually just small versions of regular carrots, and they grow like that, instead of knowing that they just take regular carrots and shave them down. You loved baby carrots. My teacher told us that mama cows have to get pregnant, and sometimes farmers just inseminate them. Like they don't even let them breed with another cow. They just do whatever they can to make sure that the cow can have a baby so it can make the hormones that make the milk that the farmers take away and bottle and give to us. When I asked what they do with the babies, nobody would tell me. I could have Googled it. Should have Googled it, right? We live in the age of infinite information at our fingertips. And it would have been so easy. But mom was so quiet. She was so sad. And I missed her. I saw her every day, but after you left, she wasn't there. It was almost like she went with you. And there was so much milk in the house. She made everyone buy that one specific brand, the red one. And every day I'd open the refrigerator door and pick it up and see your face and I needed to know. What do they do with the babies? Thank you, Lainey. Would you like to add anything before we move on? Um, I don't think so. I just want to say that, um, one, I'm really grateful that we're having this kind of panel right now. Um, really excited to be here. Really glad to share this space with Quincy and Trente and you. Um, yeah. And um, we did put Lainey's website, I believe, in the chat. So make sure you check out um, their site. And also, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Thank you, Lainey. So our next student that we are going to hear from today is Sharente Michi Tayshin Harris, who is nearing cancer. As we call on the Muslim temple walk, Natasui Sharente Michi Tayshin Harris, I am Narragansett. Uh, my name, Mashatashin, means he rises up greatly or the storm. Um, and when I was born, I was born in the midst of a thunderstorm and the hospital electricity went out three times. Um, so this is a picture of my family, um, my beautiful parents in the center my maternal grandmother next to my mother, and uh, the seven children. Uh, when I think about my inspiration for all of my artwork, um, it's inextricable from my family. Uh, and that family that ties me to this place, to this land, um, and growing up with two proud, strong Narragansett parents um, to lead me in a good way uh, with my head held high and proud. So today I am a dual degree student at Brown University and Rhode Island School of Design, uh, similar to Laney. And I am a, in the painting department at RISD and I am in the ethnic studies department at Brown, focusing on indigenous studies. Uh, and uh, I just recently was uh, accepted into uh, Yale Norfolk's uh, summer school program. Uh, and I'm very excited to be able to show some of the work that uh, led up to that. Um, but growing up in the woods of Southern Rhode Island, um, being Narragansett and hoping that the name of my people is remembered in this place is at the core of everything I do because historically the Narragansett people were the most powerful people in this region, the most numerous uh, the chief makers of our wampum kasakahog, our white and purple shell beads, which you can see my father and I wearing headdresses of. Um, 
we are the only uh, state intertribally and federally recognized tribe in the state of Rhode Island. Um, and we are tied to this place. We are people of the bay between people, people at the corner of the land at that point between the waters. Um, so uh, uh, you can move on to the next slide. And I'm excited to show you my pieces. Yeah, thank you, Sharente. It's a beautiful photo. Um, so do you wanna tell us a little bit more about this first piece here? Yes, uh, this piece uh, is really significant to me, particularly at this time. Um, yesterday was St. Patrick's Day, but it also was the 25th anniversary um, of the passing of Namashomis, my grandfather, my grandmother's fiance, Kanat Musitash or Melvin Coombs. Um, he was murdered in a hate crime and um, never found justice. And so uh, actually tomorrow we continue to honor uh, this anniversary of his passing and remember him. Um, but this piece is connected to him in this time because uh, this piece is deeply embedded into the idea of uh, interconnectivity across time. And so a popular notion today or uh, concept that people explore is indigenous futurism or Afrofuturism. Uh, I recently coined the term indigenous eternalism. Uh, the idea being that our pasts have been raped and our futures are not of our own construction and our presence um, are an apocalypse. So where do indigenous people have to go um, that is not lost in some ancient past uh, is not building off of uh, a future plagued by colonialism. We must go back to these dream worlds. Um, and the sacred act of brushing our hair uh, is something that I see my grandmother doing. And I also see my baby sisters doing. And when I see their face in that mirror, it's the same face. Um, but all around this figure are traditional combs. And so often indigenous culture, the breadth and the beauty of it, uh, the industriousness of our people is overlooked. And so I imagine dream worlds where our culture would be able to bloom throughout the hundreds and hundreds of years of genocide. Instead of that, what if our people were able to continue in our traditional way and surround ourselves in beauty? Um, so uh, this is some of my thoughts about this piece. She combs her hair in the copper mirror and awaits her lover. Her lover is not in the past or the future. Those have been stolen from her. Her lover lives in the dream time. From there, her lover gifts her the riches of a world transcending time, untouched by colonialism. With these, she basks in the unbounded excellence of her people. Artworks pervade each moment she lives, each task she carries, each story she tells and the wonders they present are wholly, uniquely indigenous. Her lover's arts are visions of a life led close to the earth. The lover returns to the world and its most mundane objects, a sense of magnificence and respect. The world becomes alive once more. On her shirt, she carries the Chthonic divinities, mushy pusau of the long body and long tail, flaming with the light of meteors, who makes the waters hiss and lives in the depths to temper her burning power. The currents and whirlpools are but the pull of her tail and her horns are the mark of her majesty. 
the dr draconic sachem, Mushi Pasau, and the many underwater spirits guard the copper and the riches of the waters. It is in the glittering shine of such splendor that the domain of our dream lover is found, waiting just beyond our own reflection. To receive the gift of such visions, we mustn't slay or subdue the vital powers that came before us, but propitiate and find peace. For we carry the light that sparks such visions with us always. We simply must allow the world to show us the beauty of our own reflection waiting all around us. Thank you so much, Rente. That was really beautiful. So here we have um, the Divine Game. Would you like to tell our audience more about that? This piece is looking at our stories of creation and the cycles that we pass through. Our story of creation is a story of recreation and it is the story of each and every day of our lives. Um, creation is not at the beginning of time, but continues through time. So here we have uh, the Manituag, the great, uh, nature's great powers. We have the twin forces on the right, Wetux, our culture hero, our grandfather, the Lord of the day. And on the left, we have his twin brother, Habamuk, or Chipi, that spirit that watches over the night, uh, guards over the dead. Um, and they are playing a traditional game called hubbub. Um, and so during this time of sickness and disease, um, I think about uh, the constant divine game that we are caught in. Um, and you can see in the piece, there are the chickadees um, and the chickadees uh, had their heads painted uh, so that they could resemble the hubba pieces that are go within the bowl. And in this game of chance, we never know how the dice will fall and who will win the game. We are in a time of transition and rebirth. When our people play hubba, the spirits of creation are embodied within us. We recognize through hubba the balance of creation amidst the dichotomies of the random and the ordered, death and life, night and day, winter and summer, hunting and planting. That is why hubbub is a medicine game played during times of sickness and celebration. It feels fitting that during this time of sickness and change, we remember the Manituag, the world's powers, are still playing the divine game and their dice are sure to turn tomorrow. Thank you. And here we have this um, last piece. Yes, We Tugs teaches the original people to make drums. So during my coming of age ceremony, uh, part of the ceremonies that we did was creating a drum. Um, and during the time that this piece was made, my younger brother was actually going through his coming of age ceremony. Um, and so surrounding the perimeter of this drum, you can see a symbol uh, which my family uses as a family crest. It's on all of our regalias. Um, and I've always been taught that that symbolizes uh, a preserver of tradition. Um, and those three uh, petals on that flower resembled the leaves of the strawberry. Um, and in the image, you can see Weetux, who was in the last piece. Um, and here he is teaching the original people. The shapeshifter, culture hero, giant and trickster, Weetux embodies life and the journeys of the ancestors. We talks offered gifts and teachings to the Narragansett people that have allowed us to live in balance with all creation. 
We Tucks taught the Narragansett how to divide and skin and brain tan the deer, how to hold ceremony for the deer, and how to carry it back to the village. When we put on our snowshoes and sing our songs, we remember the guidance of We Tucks, that great hare, and how he offered that guidance to the ancient ones. As my younger brothers come of age and make drums of their own, our stories of origin and creation resurface in the present and the cycle begins again. And with this piece, I also wrote um, a song to honor the deer and I will sing a verse of that now. And the lyrics mean, great buck, I sing of your birth, the burden you bear. Grazing in the field, I hear your heart beating. Katapatash, thank you. Thank you, Sharente. I can't reiterate how beautiful it was um, to hear from you and to see your work. And I would like to give a big thank you to all three of our students today. Um, make sure you follow them and keep up with their art, you know, what they're doing. They're really amazing. Um, and like Lainey said, it's great to be in this space with them. Um, often in Indigenous cultures, we talk about, you know, the future and seven generations down. And it's amazing to hear from our students today. So I hope you enjoyed your program. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I welcome any questions we have from audience members from either what I'm doing here at the museum or from any of our really amazing students. Um, yeah, so please let us know if you have any questions. Okay, so maybe while people are typing, I will ask a question. Um, so for all of our students, can you tell me um, what is one thing that inspires you and that um, you're excited about for the future of your art practice? That's a met big meta question, but it's gonna give us um, lots to be excited about for the future. Uh, I guess I'll start and say that uh, recently, some of the other work that I didn't show today, um, I have been experimenting with video um, and uh, the work has just exploded into um, kinds of creations that I never thought I would make. Um, but the process of working with my family to direct and record um, and to make these uh, video pieces uh, has been extremely rewarding. And I think I've been exploring with uh, collage more and more um, and working with different materials because I'm colorblind. Um, so much of my work pulls from traditional art forms that have their basis in line. Uh, and as a result of that, by looking to material, uh, I can bring depth back into my artwork. Thank you. Um, Lainey and Quincy, what is like an inspiration point and in something you're excited about? Um, I think I'm interested. Um, or like inspired by, um, I guess this isn't like super recent, but somewhat recent in like more recent years, I've been seeing more mixed people on our reservation, uh, like more black kids. Um, and I remember being like the only like dark, dark skinned um, native uh, going to our reservation and getting like a lot of stares. So with like more people coming, more people color, I think I want to like, or I'm excited to explore and delve into that more. Um, and 
Yeah, I don't have any like particular like styles or works I would want to pursue right now, mainly because of architecture picking up all my time. But <laughs> I definitely would actually like to integrate. I have more opportunities to integrate um, my uh, indigenous arts with architecture somehow. Um, and I've, I've attempted to do so with uh, mainly weaving, like basketry, like the patterns. And the weaving patterns of basketry and like using that for like facades. Um, um, but I definitely would like to maybe look more into the orientation um, and direction and um, just more like cultural stuff like that to incorporate my architecture. Um, uh, I think for me personally, one thing that I've been really excited about and really into is um, paper making. I've been thinking a lot about waste, especially waste in a place like RISD. Um, so I mean, here's some paper I've been making, um, trying to kind of have a more sustainable practice, I think is super important in the future of my work. I also am hoping I can get back to doing some bead work. Thank you guys for your answer. Um, so we have a question here in our Q&A section of Zoom. It says, how has your work at RISD impacted your connection to your community and other Native communities? That's a good question, actually. Sometimes it's actually worsened my connection. <laughs> um, not, uh, it's hard to explain, but like I feel, I don't say it would have worsened my connection, but maybe it has made it more complex. Um, Mainly because there's like a theme of, I don't know if it's just me, but I observed like when trying to contemporize or like have a new take on something that's very traditional or has been practiced in one way for a very long time, sometimes it's received a lot differently uh, from elders or just family members, even my mother um, back home. I remember like making a, an illustration and my mom got like super mad on Instagram and she was just like, nope, nope, like in the comments. And it's cause like I used, I was reinterpreting something that was traditional, um, our uh, basket caps um, and it was just, she's very offended. So sometimes like there can be, I don't know, there's, it's hard to, for me, I personally feel somewhat uh not disconnected but it's a very slippery slope with like getting connected with back home in the arts i feel more i do feel more connected to my ancestors when i am practicing the art traditionally in a traditional way but uh when contemporizing it i do sometimes feel on the edge like what should i do what shouldn't i do what will, you know so yeah yeah i like want to also kind of like echo that feeling of almost being like disconnected from my community here at RISD just by nature of being so far away but I will say um what's really nice about being here on College Hill has been being able to connect with Native people who aren't necessarily from my tribe but Native people from all over the country or Indigenous people from all over the world I know that for me like Native Natives at Brown all the native community here at RISD has been super important to me, um, like feeling okay being here. So I'm grateful for that. I think uh, without RISD, um, you know, this whole art practice uh, very easily could not be part of my life. And uh, that would bring great sadness to my heart because my artwork has been a way for um, people to see us somewhere where we have always been. One of the Narragansett tribe's biggest populations is in Providence. Um, and yet, you know, I feel most seen when I'm walking by uh, like the mural that is, you know, recognizing the Narragansett people here. Um, but the reason why RISD has, you know, been so monumental in that way is 
before RISD, uh, the high school that I went to did not have any art classes. And um, luckily I had an advisor who um, talked about, you know, have you thought about applying to RISD? And I decided on a whim to apply and started making pieces. And every piece I made from that junior year on went into my portfolio. And since then, I've been pushed to explore my work in so many ways that I wouldn't have before. Um, so there is a great gratitude there for that. Thank you guys for all of your answers. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, Rizzi is really grateful to have all three of you. So I think we're gonna do one more question that was asked in the Q&A and then we're gonna wrap up for today. Um, we have a question, it says, museum goers may not understand or care about provenance. What more can Rizzi Museum or any museum do to invite the public to know the full story of an indigenous, indigenous objects and collections beyond labels? Uh, so that's a great question. I think from the museum point of view, we've been doing a lot with making sure people's tribal affiliations are listed in the way that they would like their affiliation to be listed, whether that's in their traditional language or it's in, in English. People have, um, as we've shown today, a nuance and a diversity of identities. So. Um, and also working on making sure our labels are um, including, you know, the full breadth of story. I think one thing we know in Indigenous culture is that we are storytellers, as today we've been doing a lot of, um, we've been talking story, we've been chatting a lot. So sometimes it can be hard for a label to include all of that information. But, you know, trying our best to summarize and have key points in the labels, I think is really important. It's also great to have artist quotes. Um, I love hearing from artists directly, whether that's in written publications or talking them face to face or over Zoom. And um, yeah, I think, you know, it's a question though that I think is in museums across the country. And I definitely invite our audience to come to the RISD Museum to see how we do our labels. Um, we're not the same as different institutions, but I think we bring, um, we all bring different things to the table. So. Thank you so much for your question. And again, just a plug, come hang out at the Racing Museum. Come see what's in our galleries and our exhibitions. We're gonna have a lot of new Native American art on view this summer and fall. And again, just a plug, make sure you follow our three students that we featured today. They're doing really great and amazing work and we're so lucky to have them. And I think that's about it. Um, panelists, do you guys have anything else to add? Perfect. Okay, well, I hope everyone enjoys the weather today. I am definitely going to have to sit outside. Um, thanks again, everyone, and have a great Friday. Thank you.